Welcome everyone. My name is Stephen Villano and this is Vital Voices. The Wall Street Journal recently ranked UHD as one of the best colleges in the United States, along being number one for diversity and number three for student experience. We were ranked number 224 out of 400 best colleges in America in the Wall Street Journal College Pulse recent announcement. So UHD also scored the highest score along with Kentucky's Berea College in terms of diversity. Only 23 Texas colleges and universities in total made the top 400 with the University of Houston at 208 and us at 224. So as I said, welcome to Vital Voices. As you may know, Vital Voices serves as a forum to bring, uh, the, to, bring to the UHD community scholars and practitioners who work on issues, issues vital to the functioning of our democracy. Our guests speak from uh, their professional experiences and personal experiences as well, and their expertise about how their work impacts society. Vital Voices purposes to showcase individuals whose work is interdisciplinary and touches upon the fields of social work, criminal justice, and urban education. Over the years, we have explored subjects such as addiction, youth in the criminal justice system, homelessness, recidivism, the graying of America, how social work impacts immigration, school violence, tackling the silent epidemic of childhood grief and trauma, bail reform, and how law enforcement and mental health providers work together to assist individuals with mental disorders. So those are just to name a few. We have done a, a whole lot. We just recently did a, a series on child exploitation, a two-day series earlier in this month, as well as a session on suicide prevention called Creating Hope Through Action. So I am now going to turn the microphone over to Angel Bray Kamilovic, and she is going to tell you about Empower Youth. Thank you. All right, thank you all very much. First, I'd like to thank everybody for being in attendance today. We really appreciate it. As Empowered Youth, we truly advocate to remove the stigmas of voting and to provide knowledge and resources to increase civic engagement within our communities. And our intention is to provide a much deeper understanding to you all concerning the right to vote. Although we possess the right to vote now, we must acknowledge the challenges faced while obtaining that right. We want to give an honor to our special guests that have come all the way here to join our voters engagement panel to be able to provide insight on the issues of voting, along with provide resources to assist our students with registering to vote and utilizing your vote. Funded by the Houston Endowment, Empowered Youth is a nonpartisan program run by UHD faculty member Dr. Liza Lane and Vivian Smith and her team of social work fellows. Their mission is to help community members understand the importance of voting and to encourage them to exercise their constitutional right to vote. First, we would like to introduce a social and civic activist that has dedicated her life towards the betterment of rights for people of color. She became an activist at the young age of 16 and has been an activist ever since. Our honorable guest, Ms. Norma West Green. I don't know what I'm thanking you for other than it's so kind of you to acknowledge me like that. Um, I have, uh, as I told them in the lobby, I have not prepared anything because I, um, it was about me. So I didn't know, I didn't, couldn't rehearse anything. But I, um, I think that you want to hear about the fact that I was at the March on Washington in 1963. I was there. Uh, it was the day before my 20th birthday, which was 60 years ago, so you now know how old I am. <laughs> I was, um, my friends had a birthday party for me to raise money, because we were all so poor, to raise money for the train. I was living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And the, they raised all the money that I needed, which was $12. That's how much the train ticket cost, was $12, which was, you know, that was big stuff because we didn't have anything. But I, people ask me all the time, why did I go? And it, I didn't know not to. It, it, when they started talking about it, I said, well, I have to go to that because you have to understand in Pittsburgh, 
at that time, we had not heard anything about segregation or discrimination. Never. I went to school with white kids. My parents went to school with white kids. So I never knew until we on the news and we heard about what was happening um, in Little Rock. And I couldn't believe that. I thought, they won't let people do things because they're black. I had no clue. None. I had So I had to be about 15 years old, which I thought, well, that's so stupid and it's so wrong. But I had no clue. None of us did. So that's how I got started. I, I wanted to know what was, this was about and what I could do about it. And um, what I did about it was I went to the march. I went to several. That was the most famous. I got arrested many, many times. Many times. Um, I went through the experience that we all did getting arrested, you know, getting hit, getting hosed, having our, um, calling names, the whole thing. But it's what, it's what we did. We expected it. Uh, there, there were a couple of times I was arrested twice the same day. I would come out and then they arrest us again 10, 10 minutes later. The only time I was, I was never afraid because we were with each other. The only time I was afraid was, um, now keep in mind, we didn't have much money, so we couldn't go far, but I could get as far as, as Ohio. And they took us in, uh, to some, in the, in the dark of night out in a field in Ohio in a train car and left us there. <laughs> and, you know, although Ohio is close to Pittsburgh, like a three hour drive, but it was, that was the only time I was ever afraid. But what I want to tell you is I see all you young people here. My reason for being here is not telling you that I was someplace 60 years ago. The disappointment in that is it never occurred to us in these 60 years or when I was there that we would ever have to talk about this again. We thought we fixed it. We thought it was all over, but it certainly is not. <clears throat> I have been involved in getting the vote, getting people to vote, especially young people, because for some reason, and I don't know, young people have no interest in voting. And that's horrible. Because without voting, you would not have this school. You would not have the streets. You would not have firemen to put out your fire when your house starts burning down. You wouldn't have them if you didn't, if you, if you continue not to vote. That's where the money comes from. I think what you're thinking of as young people is what you're seeing on um, CNN and MSNBC. It's all about Washington. No, it's not. It's about what's happening locally. And we have a local election coming up. Early voting starts October 23rd. Remember that? Election day is November 7th. I'll be working the polls. The sad thing about that is my friend sitting next to me, who is my age, will be working the polls with me. And the other people working the polls with me will be our age. The only time we have young people working the polls is they give us a student tech. And that's terrible. People don't want to leave their job for one day to work the polls. So eventually, you know, my daughter reminded me, I don't have that many summers left. And that's true. Who's going to take over? We're expecting you people to take over. We're expecting you to have to use the voice that you have. And you're not using it. You're not, you're not declaring the sickness of the a TEA takeover of HISD, and it is just plain sick what they're doing to minority children. I believe, I, I truly believe this, that the only way we have ever had anything changed and improved upon was when we hit the streets. I truly believe that because I know it's true. You cannot solve a problem like this sitting down at a table drinking coffee. It's not going to work. You know, George Floyd, when they hit the streets, what happened? Aunt Jemima's gone. Hmm. It's, it's important. 
Um, we never did anything about that all these years. You have gays, more gays on television and commercials, more black people because of that. His daughter was right. He changed the world. And it was true. But you have to hit the streets. I was so disappointed when the takeover, the HISC takeover happened in June and not one person hit the street. My daughter is in the system and I would say to her all the time, why aren't you guys marching? Why don't you, why are you letting this happen? You have more control than one man. You have more control than what Hot Wheels has. You have much more control and you have to use it. Parents should be running the schools, not the state. And they're not doing it. Because if you go to look at some of the white schools or the Jewish schools, they would never let that happen to their schools. Never. My granddaughter is in one of them. We don't have to worry about that school at Parker. But at the black schools, the all Hispanic schools, they are trying to destroy them. Don't let it happen. Use your voice. I used mine. But honey, I'm 80 years old now. I'm not going to go out and march anymore. I'm not. I have a cane here. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I am not going to do it. I did my marching. I did my whatever. I've been to jail. I don't mind. I affected with him. I went to jail and, and registered prisoners. <laughs> I, I, I've done all that. It's time for you to do it now. Because without your help, Nothing is going to change. And if it doesn't change, where will you be in 10 years? If you are a minority, the voter suppression is getting worse every day. I was telling somebody that I, I, anybody who wants to register to vote or change their name or address, I have whatever you need out there. But we have a certain form that we use that I was running out of and I called and I asked uh, in Austin, could they send me some? And they said, they don't have any more. I said, well, can you print them? I said, no, we can't do that. That's voter suppression. They don't want us to have them because they don't want us to register because they don't want the kids to vote. The average voter in Harris County is 67 years old. Why is that? Where are you? I said, when we, when, when in my polling place, when we have a teenager who comes and votes for the first time, we stand up and applaud them. But in addition to that, I have had people in their 60s who have voted for the first time. That's horrible. So we have to, you have to know that the reason things are the way they are is not because of bad politicians. It's because people don't vote. People are not using their voices, and you have to do that. And I think that it's wonderful that you're here, but don't leave here and say, oh, well, that was interesting what that lady said. Do something about it. Make yourself important. I'm not. I am not important in anything that I've done. I did what I did because I thought it had to be done, and I still do. I still sit out in the heat in the summer and register voters. I still sit in my church lobby and register voters. I've registered people in the grocery store lane. I have. You know, I just look back and say, you registered? She'll say no. I say, oh, hold on. Let me run to my car. And, <laughs> and I do because it has to be done. So commit. I have some fans out there for you that say commit to vote. And they came from the National Organization of Women. Commit to vote. You only have a short time. The 10th of this month, which is next week, is the last day to register. And registering is not just registering the first time if you need to change your address or you got married or you just don't like your name and changed it. Um, I don't like my middle name. I should have changed it years ago. And just, you need to get that done, okay? If you want to register today while I'm here, I'll be glad to register you. If not, find somebody to register you. But please go and vote. And now you don't have to just vote in your precinct. 
you can vote in anywhere in Harris County if you're in Harris County. If you're not in Harris County, I don't know how it is in Fort Bend County. It's probably just their precinct. I don't know, but not in Harris County. You can go anywhere you want. It is like that in... Okay. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Because I have nothing more to tell you. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, I've heard that you were at the March on Washington before. I never heard you actually tell the story. We refer to those days as the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. What did y'all call it? Did you know that you were in the midst of this historic? Oh, thing no, no. We had no idea. Um, in fact, uh, I, I went with the Student on Violent Coordinating Committee, and um, the reason that I went with that group and I was a member was because Stokely Carmichael was the head of the group, and I thought he was the sexiest man known to mankind. <laughs> That's the truth. That is that is the truth. That's why I went with them. Um, <laughs> you know what can I say? It's, that's that's why I went. Uh, no, we had no idea. In fact, um, we were having a meeting the night before we left, and we thought maybe they would um, we would have maybe a thousand people there. We really did. And when I got there, it was like eight o'clock in the morning. Um, it, it was too early to, for people were, were not coming in yet. So we didn't know until that afternoon that a quarter of a million people showed up. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you this, and I, I, I'm just learning this. The young man who is not young anymore, whose idea it was to have the march, his name is Bayard Rustin. I did not know who he was because they told us it was A. Philip Randolph, and that's all I knew was A. Philip Randolph, but he worked with A. Philip Randolph. But my nephew is a filmmaker, and um, he told me about it, and he's, there's a film coming out in November called Rustin, and I would urge you all to see this movie. Um, Chris Rock is in it. He plays A. Philip Randolph, as a matter of fact. Yeah. It's going to be an excellent movie about a man that did. The reason that he, we didn't know. I, I did not know because uh, I thought it was A. Philip Randolph. But the reason that he did not want himself known was he was um, homosexual and he was a, a communist. And at that time, that just was not done. You know, it, you know, McCarthy was still doing his communist thing. And um, in the 60s, it, it, there was no such thing as a, people were still going to get cured if they were homosexual. It's so sad, isn't it? <laughs> but um, so I, the movie, it's on Netflix. In fact, it is being produced, it has been produced by Barack and Michelle Obama. They have a, a partnership with Netflix, and this is their first feature film that they produced. So they have produced it. And I, it's called Rustin, and I would urge you all to go for your his, for your history and for your for, for, um, frame of reference about what we did. Because we're back in a time when you all may have to do what we did. And, and you have to understand that. You're going to have to, especially the minorities, especially Hispanics and black kids, you have to do it. Just this, the schools would not have been taken over had, or they would not, it wouldn't have lasted this long had you all hit the streets. You should have been hitting the streets. And I truly believe that the only place that there's a solution to these kinds of problems is on your feet in the street. And as I said, I can't go with you. However, I am having a block walk to get out the vote on the 14th of this month from my house. And if any of you would like to come and walk and knock on doors to get people to vote, I'd love to have you. Just get in touch with me or Dr. Smith and... Um, they can get in touch with me, and I can. They can tell you where I live, and that's it. Do you have any other? Yeah, I have a question. So, as I just think about the fact that you went to jail so many times, and at least there, for the most part, you didn't play. You all were all together. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, 
They did, they just let they just let us out because there was, there was nothing to keep us in there for. Um, it was a it was so dramatic, and it was good um, PR for them, not us. And so they let us out after like maybe a day, two days at the most. Mm -hmm. But 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 being afraid of being in a cell, as I said, I was with the group, so no, I wasn't. I knew they weren't going to hurt me like that because they had people there and they had witnesses. Uh, but is it fun going to jail? Of course not. In fact, my daughter uh, adopted her daughter, and we had to have our fingerprints taken. And she came home and she says, Mom, you really did go to jail, didn't you? I said, yeah. <laughs> They found out, I said, well, yeah, nobody just brags about that. <laughs> yes, I did go. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, I hope that I have impressed you enough to vote. This is, as I said, October 23rd. It's early voting for two weeks until November 3rd. Election day is November 7th. And then we're going to turn around again in March and have the primary for the 2024 presidential, okay? I just wanna say thank you so much, uh, Ms. Green. Thank you for, so much for your story. It is very inspirational. I'm just talking about my own experience and how just, Listening to you is very inspirational just to go out there, you know, just like how you were talking, how a lot of young people don't go really out there and know how lucky they are that they have this right to vote and they don't really do nothing about that. I wish a lot of people could understand that and actually do something about that. They, a lot of, a lot of times, complain about the future and how all these decisions are being made, yet we're not doing our part of doing the vote to change that. Um, with that, I'm going to be introducing our second guest. It's going to be Mr. Durero Douglas. Mr. Douglas is a versatile individual with a rich background as a community organizer, nonprofit executive, and real estate developer. In 2014, Mr. Douglas co-founded Houston Justice, a nonprofit focused on voter reg registration and provided essential resources to thousands of individuals. He also launched Project Orange, a civic engagement initiative aimed at enabling eligible incarcerated individuals to vote. Okay, so hi. Hi, I. So Mr. Douglas has dedicated over a decade to community organizing, lobbying, and policy advocacy. His notable accomplishments include contributing to the minimum wage increase in Washington State and working on electoral campaign for prominent figures such as Barack Obama, Elizabeth Warren, and Hillary Clinton. Mr. Douglas has a strong track record of community involvement, having served on the board of organizations like the League of Women Voters Houston and the Akras Home Community Advocacy Group. And without further ado, we have Mr. Douglas. Thank you so much. It's always weird to hear when people read your stuff, right? Um, First of all, thank you, uh, Mr. Villanos, and to the people of Empower Youth, because the work that you're doing, not only today, but uh, year round is really important and is really gonna make a difference. So I wanna tell you a little bit about me, a little bit about a few things in my life that have led to the work that I do, a little bit about how my organization was founded, 
and then we'll do a Q&A. Does that sound good? Sounds good. So um, they mentioned a little bit before that I'm originally from Houston, Texas. I grew up in a place called South Park on a street called Selinski. Anybody know about Selinski? Okay. Crestmont Village, ring a bell. Um, so I grew up in Crestmont Village. And at the time, this is the 90s. So, you know, it was the hood, but we didn't know it was the hood because it was home. Right. And I'm part of the last generation who played outside. Right. So I played Nintendo and Sega Genesis, but we still actually played outside. We played games like Red Light, Green Light, Nick or Knock, or Doorbell and Dash, I think they call it now. It's where you go and you go ding dong, and then you can hear somebody coming. You run away before they get to the door. And two of my closest friends that lived at Christmas Village were Jeremy and Slim. Jeremy could sing very, very well. He should have been in an R&B group. Uh, and Slim was really, really fast. And when we played Red Light, Green Light, or uh, Tag, that's another one. I know I'm ringing a bell for some people. Uh, Slim would always win because he was Slim, right? And now the nickname makes sense. So these were the people that I hung around the most uh, in my elementary years and middle school years. And then towards high school, we ended up um, sort of like the Jeffersons moving uh, to the east side. Well, we're moving on up, right? Um, and we didn't move to the east side. We actually moved to the southwest side. And I ended up attending Westbury High School. And it was at Westbury High School where I was sort of separated from those really close friends, right? And um, I had my first sort of uh, organizer moment uh, inside of HISD. So I was actually expelled my 11th grade year. I had gone to the high school for law enforcement for three years. And then they, I pulled a chance card and it said, do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Go to your home school. So that's what I did in that school was Westbury. And I looked at the difference between the school that I came from, which was this magnet school, and the school that I was zoned to. Both public schools, both within HISD, both getting the same county, state, and federal funds, but two totally different instances. And as a senior in high school, I had a very late light load because I got to enroll myself so they were like, do you want to take a fourth year of science? No. <laughs> do you want to take a fourth year of math? No. So I took like art, band, and, you know, government, right? So we have this assembly, and it's all seniors, and they announce that only 30% of the seniors had passed, at the time it was tax, it's now star, but only 30%. 3% had, and I was just stunned because the school that I came from, there was one person who failed the science part, Joshua Fungimi. I remember his name to this day. He failed the science part. And so, like, what's the difference? Don't we have the same books? Don't we have the same? What is the huge difference? And there were a few different things. So as a senior, I'm realizing they do these things called hall sweeps. Anybody know what a hall sweep is? When the bell rings, if you're not in... Teachers lock the doors. Administrators come through herding us like cattle, right? So I'm a senior, right? So if I miss 10 minutes of art, right, because I had to be herded to the auditorium to get a pass to class, that's one thing. But if you're a ninth grader who's taking algebra and you've missed 10 minutes of algebra, being late shouldn't be, it shouldn't have a consequence of therefore failing this class. Because when you're so behind in certain classes, it's insurmountable to catch up, right? So the baby organizer in me wrote all these things down and I created a memo and I typed it up in the library and I went to the principal secretary and I requested a time to meet with the principal. Dr. Lee. 
And she looked at me and she was like, sure, I'll get back with you. I checked back a couple of days later, nothing. About a week later, you know when somebody's blowing you off? I figured they were blowing me off. So I went back to the library. Copies were five cents a piece. And with about three of my own dollars, I made 60 copies of that memo and put it in every box in the, in the maid office. So all my teachers got it, right? All my teachers, including Mr. Schetzer, who was my government teacher. So like the next day I'm in government class and he's like, Darrell, come here. You wrote this? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you're saying what we wish we could say. We say this, they don't listen, right? We say this stuff, but we could lose our jobs. If we go down to the school board and we speak, it has a different consequence, right? A couple of days later, I'm in band. I play trumpet, not very well. And there's a knock at the door. And it's the principal secretary. And she calls my band director, Mr. Williams, over. And she you know how the teachers kind of put their thing up and they kind of, right? And he's like, what? And then she says something else and he points directly at me and calls me over. So I'm like, oh, sh right? <laughs> so I get over there and he said, no, she says, um, I don't know what you did, but apparently like you wrote something and Dr. Abe Saavedra, the superintendent, wants to meet with you and Dr. Lee on Tuesday. So he wants to meet with you now, right? And I'm like, okay. So I'm, you know, a senior in high school, I'm like, oh my God, I have effed up now, right? <laughs> And so into Dr. Lee's office, I go and I sit down and he's like, hey, you know, I heard about your memo and sorry, I didn't get back to you. And, you know, we we got to go down to the district. There's like a permission slip. But don't worry about that. We'll figure out that later. I just want to make sure that we kind of coordinate and that we're on the same page. So that when we and I said, you know, Mr. Lee, I don't think we're on the same page. I said in. I just think it'd probably be better. A spontaneous conversation with the superintendent would probably be better. Game on. There's the start of the story. And so for the first time, I saw what's possible when David is approached by Goliath. I got to experience a little piece of what Miss Norma West Green here. Let me just say what an honor it is. Can we give her a hand? What an honor it is to be like on a program with her, right? Like that's life goals right there. And so, you know, the rest is, is pretty much history. I would go on to graduate, bottom of my class, at Westbury High School. And I saw this billboard that said, make $2,700 a month, be a correctional officer. And I thought, Darrell, you're 18, right? You got a one point something GPA, right? Good luck, right? So I dial the number, I go through orientation, I go through boot camp. At the age of 18, I start at the CT Terrell unit in Rose Sharon, Texas as a correctional officer. And alongside me, was my mother who'd been laid off. And for those of y'all that have never been laid off, I'll fill you in on something. You get a certain amount of time and then they like go from like state funds to federal funds or something. And eventually it's like you're 50 whatever week and you don't get a check no more. And that's where she was. So we started at this unit and it's six weeks of training and then you, they actually send you to your unit and for the first six weeks there, you're on what they call OJT. Anybody know what OJT stands for? On the job training. So you don't really get to do the actual CO work. You kind of do pad searches in a hallway and stuff like that. And so one day, about my sixth week, I'm doing just that. And down the hall, I hear, Durrell! It was Slim. 
Slim. So he comes up. He's like, what the hell are you doing here? And I'm like, what the hell are you doing here, right? I'm in a uniform. He's in a uniform. I'm an officer. He's an inmate. And I thought to myself, Westbury High School, 30%. Principal who doesn't have the time to respond to the memo from the student. Where do those students end up if they're just going with the tide? What is the natural tide? What is 13th grade for students who live in a neighborhood that's considered the hood? It's the prison. So I would spend five years there as a CO, and then I figured out, like, oh, when you make sergeant, you get a little more money, you get a little bit of air conditioning. And then I figured out you make lieutenant, you get even more money and even more air conditioning. And I just went on this, like, money air conditioning spree for, like, five years, you know, just getting more money, more air conditioning. Um, And then, let me know on time, too, like, can somebody, because I kind of get lost, okay. Yeah, uh, my it's my now my first or I'm ending my first year as a lieutenant. I'm 23 years old, and my senior warden at the time said 10 words that changed my life forever. And they're 10 words that I want to share. Oh, are you crying? Okay, I was about to say, gosh, <laughs> I ain't even. I left some stuff out. Um, he said 10 words that you know, I want to share with you as well. And it's, when he said it, he meant it one way, but to me, it was a clarion call. I'm 23. I'm a lieutenant. I'm like, you know, making everything tech. Like I started taking count with the Excel. Like I, like, I was like, why am I doing this with a pencil and a 10 key by touch? Like you do know they give us these computers. And so I'm doing little things like that. I'm, I still call the inmates, yes, sir, no, sir. In the beginning, not because I was trying to make a point, it was because I was 18 and they were older than me. Everybody was older than me. It's yes, sir, no, sir. It started not to make a point, but it ended by making a point. Because what I realized was when you treat a person like a human being, they rise to the occasion. And so those 10 words, he said, you know, you're doing this, you're doing that, you know, just keep your nose clean. He said, this is not a place for innovation and fresh ideas. (laughs) Right? Clearly, it was implied and inferred. But to hear those words come from this man's mouth gave me permission. It gave me permission to go and to find that place where my innovation and fresh ideas would work. So that's the first challenge that I give to everyone that's in that room, in this room. So I would end up putting in my letter of resignation. People thought I was crazy. They were like, you're giving up your state job with benefits? It's like, yeah, this is not where I'm supposed to be. I could feel it, right? And I knew, first of all, if I run out of money, they'll take me back, number one. But number two, I didn't want to look back and wonder what coulda, shoulda, woulda been. And I wanted uh, to take that leap. And what that leap looked like was leaving, um, eventually volunteering, actually, with Erica Lee, who uh, I didn't know at the time was Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee's daughter, on this very campus, um, registering voters, uh, and then eventually getting the opportunity to work in the state legislature. Um, and then eventually founding a nonprofit, Houston Justice. And so that has been my North Star. That has been sort of what, you know, it's not air conditioning and more money anymore. My North Star is now creating a world where fewer people who look like me, who come from neighborhoods like the one that I came from, or whose paychecks look like my mom's paycheck, fewer of those people end up behind bars and end up in a world where opportunity is absolutely uh, available to everyone. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions that you have. Yes. So which school had the 30%? Was it, which school had the 30%? Was it Westbury? It was Westbury High School. 
And the one you had with there before was? The High School for Law Enforcement and Criminal Justice. Got it, okay, all right. And what's, what's, what was interesting, too, that sort of ties into the story and also what Ms. Norma West Green was talking about, in Westbury's, uh, in the hallway, the main hallway, they have sort of each class year since the school was founded, like they take their graduation picture. And you can see when the school was first built, nobody looked like me. And then over time, towards the end, everybody looks like me. And so when that happens, you know, you got to you got to look at like what are the different changes that end up happening, right? Not only to the color of skin of everybody that's attending, but how does that impact decisions that are made, opportunity that exists? Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about Houston Justice and what you do there and why it's so important the work that you do there? Absolutely. So Houston Justice was actually founded um, everybody remember when Ferguson exploded, when Ferguson was lit, Ferguson ignited a fire that burned across the United States for days and weeks and months, and it's still burning today. So someone on Facebook had did a post, they created an event and it said, whenever they come out with the decision for the officer that was responsible for, for killing Michael Brown, that the day after we're going to meet at McGregor Park. And so the, that happened. And the next day, there's a rally. And unbeknownst to us, that rally becomes a march. And I'll never forget because that day I was wearing Timberland boots without socks because it was laundry time. And I was like, do I, st I could just go and it's just a rally and I'm wearing pants. No one will know I'm not wearing socks. Well, we marched and we marched and we marched from McGregor Park all the way. If you know where the Denny's is on 288 and uh, in Southmore. And along the way, though, along the way, and we like took over the street like it, it, it was a thing. I ran into people that never cared before. One of my cousins was there. I was like, Joseph, what are you doing here? How did you find? Were you in the group text? Like, you know, this thing just grew and grew and grew. And so at the end, we were like, we have to do something with this. So we went back to my one bedroom apartment and I'm an organizer. So I always have butcher paper and I always have some markers. I'm pretty sure Miss Norman West Green keeps voter registration cards and a folding table. And y'all usually have a little thing with candy or something like that. They always have good candy, too. Um, and so we go back to my apartment and we just start like writing, like what could come from this? I mean, we just brainstormed. It was like I was in the movie Rain Man. There were there were butcher papers every, stuck against the wall everywhere. And Houston Justice was born that night. And we had three initial goals. Was we started with like fifty, and we narrowed it down to three. And they were, you know, number one, we we looked at the fact that like we didn't have body cams in Houston, right? And don't both sides act better when there's a camera on them. The officers kind of sit up straight. The people kind of sit up straight, right? And I had a little bit of experience with that uh, working at the prison. The second thing that we wanted to do was part of what made the fire happen in Ferguson was the fact that all this grand jury stuff that was happening that was private was now available, all the transcripts, right? Right. Well, we found out that in Texas, they still get to keep it, right? And then we found out what a grand jury was. Because all I knew was grand jury, what, like that's jury duty. No, it's different. That's a pettit jury. The grand jury is what decides uh, whether someone's actually charged or indicted or not, right? So we wanted to change that in Texas. We furthermore learned how these people were chosen. They used to call, do what was called the key man system, which means I'm a judge. I like Miss Norman West Green. I say, hey, go round up some folks for me. Go recruit some some people, right? And then the requirements to serve on a grand jury, you got to be available two or three days a week, every week. Who are you excluding? Anyone who works, anyone whose paychecks look like my mom, a lot of people who look like me, a lot of people who come from my neighborhoods, but who's on the other side of that decision very often. So that was the second thing that we wanted to do. And the third thing, I don't really remember, but if I 
it wasn't that important if I don't remember, right? And so, you know, from there, we actually, the next legislative session, were able to get a bill passed that changed the key man system. Um, part of what we did, the district attorney at the time um, was Devin Anderson. And it's so interesting the way each of our stories each of the pieces of each of our stories are like puzzle pieces that are necessary for the next step. So remember how, you know, the whole organizing thing with the memo and the principal and da da da, da right? And then I worked in the legislature. So I got to see, like, how some people say one thing, but then I've literally heard people say, I got to vote yes because my district, but it's not going to go anywhere, right? I literally got to see how some lobbyists are gangster. Like, they will kill other bills that have nothing to do with your thing. It's like, this gives can candy to cancer patients. It's like, we'll kill it if you don't stop it, right? So all of those were necessary pieces when I'm now meeting with the district attorney and she's like, yeah, I'm for it, blah, blah, blah. Put it in writing. Will you do an op-ed in the Houston Chronicle? Will you agree to this and this and this? Like knowing exactly what to ask, what are the necessary components to actually make it stick? So all of those were, were pieces of what we started as. Now, over time, um, our work has changed. Um, we were the first to do the jail-based the jail based voter initiative, Project Orange, where we looked at the fact that 75% of those who are in jail on any given moment, roughly 75% are pretrial. This means these people's right to vote has not been taken. Who's registering them? How are they able to vote? You have 10,000 people at the Harris County Jail. That's 7,500 votes. What does your paycheck look like if you can't afford $500 to get out of jail for a misdemeanor? What does your paycheck look like when you can't afford an attorney and are dependent upon a public defender, right? What does this audience look like that's in this jail? The same people who are very often disenfranchised or there's an extra hurdle to get their, their vote to the ballot box. And so we met with the sheriff and we said, hey, we want to go in and we want to register voters. And luckily, somebody had been chasing air conditioning and money at the prison <laughs> to know how to write the proposal from a security standpoint. I used their language. I used their thing. So there was no way they could say no. Right. And then it was like, okay, we, we, we can register people and we can do absentee ballots. We want a polling location at the jail. And in 2021, we were able, as part of a coalition of organizations, to make that happen. To make that happen. I mean, then we got to the point where, where we were going dorm to dorm, cell to cell inside the jail, and we saw, okay, voting is just one Oh, time. Thank you. Boom. There we go. I'll, I'll go all night if y'all let me. But, yeah. Okay. And, yeah, Andy, go ahead. Hi, Darrell. Um, so I love your storytelling, by the way. Um, you really took me there and your brilliant mind. So you were talking about um, you, how you came up in school, and it seems like you've been a rebellion at heart um, in a great way, right? Resili res resili resiliency building, that's what I call it. Um, so two questions when it comes to starting your own, stepping out there, right? Um, what have you learned about yourself? Um, and also, uh, sorry. I mean, hey, you know, what have you learned about yourself, number one, when it comes to being a leader and doing something out of the norm, right? And two, what have you learned about your relationship with other people? Like how people may come at you because you're doing something different, because you spoke on, uh, oh, Darrell, you're crazy for stepping, you know, you want to let go of your benefits, all of that. So, I mean, I'm sure you've learned something about other people and how they may handle the way that you move. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Absolutely. Great questions. I'll start with number two first. Uh, relationship with other people. So, 
my number one person that I have to convince or at least get her feedback is my mother. I have to run it by mom. And if anyone can change my mind or make me, it's mom. And if she can't convince me, I'm, I'm one because it's, it's, it's good to go. I think a lot of times when we're given an idea, a lot of times when we're put in a position, a lot of times when you're, you know, working, volunteering over here, at this organization, and you say they should do it like this or they should do it like that. Or a lot of the things that you're put through are sometimes to inspire you to fix the thing. And if you're going to step out to build something, you got to have your blinders on at some point, right? Because you have to think about it, whether it's founding an organization, deciding to start college, deciding to change your major, it's you who's been in the shower, thinking about this thing, laying awake at night, really pondering this thing. So when somebody else gets a snippet of it, they're just giving their 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 reply. So very rarely do I accept applause. So it's a lot of times that people are like, hey, we want to give your organization an award, this or that. I prefer not because it's a slippery slope. And then you end up like some people who share my nameless, who chase that the way I was chasing the air conditioning and, and the money at the prison. And so, yeah, people will put their fear. Oh, sorry. Two minutes. Great. They'll put their fear on you and you have to have your blinders on. It, take the meat, leave the bone. Some of the stuff is actually worth it. And then what I learned about myself, I would say, um, I still believe in Santa Claus. I'm still optimistic. And I think there are a lot of us that still are to where as a society, We've been through a lot. When you look historically, sometimes it has taken a villain to inspire a nation to rise up. Sometimes it takes a Goliath to draw out a David. So at the end of the day, like try to find what your place in the thing is. It may not be holding a megaphone. It may be at the signing table. It may be making copies. It may be making dinner. For the folks after the protest. And with that, thank you so much. Uh, this has been great. And uh, HOUJustice.org for more information about Houston Justice. Thank you so much, Mr. Douglas, for that. Um, our third speaker will be uh, Joel Amarwoods. I'm sorry. Um, he has dedicated three years of his life post-retirement to the League of Women Voters. In 2021, he developed a special interest in youth voter registration and civic engagement. Leading to this, appoint to this appointment as a coordinator for youth voter registration and civic engagement for the League of Women of Voter Houston in February in the same year. Okay. Dr. Hobble Morris. Connection to the to the University of Houston downtown runs deep as his late wife. Dr. Joel Abomawars held the esteemed position of professor of microbiology at UHD. In her honor, um, in her honor, a scholarship was established by family, colleagues, and friends, providing financial support to microbiology students pursuing summer internship in the Texas Medical Center. And without further ado, Dr. Joel. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, and I want to especially thank Ms. Green because she laid the table for me to talk about something that's very, very important to me. And I, before I start off, I, oh, this is the wrong slide here. Let me see here. This, this talk was designed for young people. And I'd like to know just 
How many of you are less than 29 years old? Just raise your hand. Okay, so this is for you. And I'm going to tell you that the most disenfranchised group is not black people or Latino people or rich, you know, poor people. It, the, the most disenfranchised group because of their choice are young people. And I believe that if young people voted, they would change the world. And that's why I'm here. I want to make some acknowledgments here for people that helped me with this presentation. I'd like also to give a special shout out to Empowered Youth who uh, helped me with this presentation and also have a special survey that I'm going to ask you guys to take. And what I would ask, just so we don't, I'm kind of a numbers guy, and so just so we don't cloud the data, I'd just like the people who are under 29 to take part in this survey. <clears throat> So in the 2022 midterms, uh, there was a lot of, the, 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 Tufts University analyzed why the uh, turnout of 18 to 29 year olds in the election was so bad, or relatively bad. And I'm gonna show you data from their studies and also census data. And I hope to prove to you that if young people vote, we, you will change the world. Old people like me are making decisions for people like you. And that shouldn't be. So in 2022, Tufts University looked at the top issues among 18 to 29 year olds. And you can see it's inflation and gas prices, abortion and reproduction of health, jobs that pay a living wage and climate change. This was a time when Roe versus Wade was turned over. So, so, as I said, Empowered Youth has a homegrown survey. And I'd like to know if you're under 29, what are your issues? And it's a ranking system. And what's important for you, if you could convince your local or city or state or federal uh, legislatures and government to do something for you, what would it be? So take some time and please answer that survey, okay? Um, we can talk about the weather while you're doing that, okay? <laughs> thank, thank God it's a little bit, thank God it's a little bit cooler in Houston. Has everybody taken the survey or are we still doing it? Anybody not done with the survey? Take your time, just take your time. You might say, well, well, how do I get into this? Well, I'm a retired doctor, and my wife and I have a good life. I have grandkids, I've got children, and I'm very worried about our democracy. I'm, I'm frightened, not so much for my life, because maybe by the time you know what hits the fan, I'll be dead, okay? <laughs> but I am worried about, the, uh, about our country. And I'm worried about it being not not losing it, it be, not becoming a staying a democracy, and so that's why I'm very impassioned about this, and why I have, um, you know, have a special interest in youth voter engagement and registration. And it's not just getting young people to vote, to register, it's to get them to vote. Everybody done with the survey? Anybody? Everybody okay? Okay. You, are you okay? Yeah, okay. Let's see here. So this is the most important slide of the whole presentation, and I'm going to present it again. And I'm sorry that I'm, I'm as I said, I'm kind of a data guy, and so this is, you know, this. So what this is is from the U.S. Census data of the 2022 midterm elections, and. You can see different age groups, 18 to 29, 30 to 44, 45 to 64, and greater than 65. And there's two bars. There's a blue bar, that's the eligible people to vote. 
In other words, people who could vote. The orange bars are who actually voted, okay? And you see on the side, you see numbers ranging from 10 to 80,000. You just multiply that times 1,000. So for instance, among 18 and 29 year olds, there'd be close to 50 million potential voters, okay? 50 million. Anybody see something funny going on in this slide? Anybody want, I mean, this is not a test. I'm just asking out, what, what, what do you see in this slide? Nobody wants to tell me what they see? Exactly. And what about young people? Do they vote, do they vote, do they vote proportionally to the other groups? 18, 29, they're way down, okay? And, and by the way, in the midterms in 2022, they had the most youth turnout, and this is what it was. Youth turnout in the elections is becoming steadily increasing, and yet these are the numbers. So Tufts University did some research on why uh, students didn't register. And 25% um, wasn't important to them. 17% didn't have the time. You know, I, I wonder, you know, Miss Green went out there in March and then she's big on getting people to vote. And people were put in jail because they couldn't vote and wanted to vote. And Daryl went and, and helped with disenfranchised citizens in the jail who were there for misdemeanors and couldn't vote. So, you know, uh, the, 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 you know, 25%, not important to me. And 17% didn't have the time. Okay, so these, this is again from Tufts. And these are individuals who actually could vote and didn't. So they're registered, they just don't show up. And so if you look at the green and the light blue uh, wedges, 70% of 18 to 29 year olds either were forgot, forgot, too busy, or didn't think it mattered. 70%, okay? And yet, again, old people like myself are making decisions for them. Tufts tried to do a deep dive, and why was that? Why are why are uh, young people uh, not voting? And they said, well, maybe they're not getting contacted by political organizations, uh, uh, community organizations, candidates, different parties. And the green bar shows you that, uh, that they were contacted at least once. And the light, light blue bar is multiple times. And you can see that the less than half the young people were contacted by someone about voting. So here's the question. I would really like some response here. These are things that empowered youth and I thought of about why do older citizens vote more than younger ones? Do you guys like this list? Is there anything um, that uh, you, know, you think we should put on there? Any kind of discussion about this? Yeah. They, they, they can relate to the candidates, but more often. Oh, they can relate to the candidates more often. They see themselves in the people that are running. So in other words, because most of the politicians are older, they don't relate to them. Okay. That's, a, that's an excellent point, and I'm going to come back to that. Uh, to add to that, I think they uh, relate a little bit more to the process, too, as well, you know, um, the process of voting, you know, um, as opposed to the alternative, right, um, which would be instead of uh, going down to like a polling station, young people these days are more apt to do things on their phone or um, they're less apt to go out and find the place to vote. They won't there or, you know, find the ways to vote um, that would be, you know, a little bit more inclined to people who have done that. 
Got it. Oh. Well, the system doesn't make it easy for that to happen. And so it takes a little bit of work, and I'll get to that. Um, <clears throat> I would say that they care and they have more incentive to vote um, for um, things like Social Security, and uh, they have uh, understanding of why it's important. Well, this is my viewpoint about this is that older people vote their interests. And they don't have a PhD, and many of them don't have a PhD in political science to make a decision. It's based on where they have a job and what their union says or what their clergy tells them or, or things like that. And so people make decisions. Some people are very well educated and they try to research something, and some people just do things based on the economies and stuff like that. And my point is, is that if older people vote their interests, why don't younger people vote their interests? So I'm gonna come back to this slide here because this is the most important slide. And it's essentially a duplication, the same slide you saw before, but this time I put in the actual percentage of each, of, of each group that actually voted. So 18 to 29 year olds, 29% of the potential voters voting. 65 and above my age, and, and probably Miss well, Miss Green told us how old she is, so we okay. <laughs> I don't know how old you are, Daryl, but I'm guessing you're in the 30 to 64 year old range anyway. 66% of older people voted. Now, if you take all the blue columns and add them together, and we're all, you know. That's 240 million votes, 240 million votes. About half people voted in the, in the midterms. This again, midterm data. Does anyone want to, I'm gonna do a little quiz here. <coughs> if young people voted at the same rate as people over 65, how many more votes do you think it would be? How many people think it would be two million? Raise your hand. Two million. Good. How many people would think it's seven million? How many people would think it's 10 million? How many, 10 million. How many people think it's 15 million? Okay, well the right answer is 10 million. And when you divide 10 million more voters by a potential pool of 240, million voters, that's about 4%. I will tell you in our society right now, elections can be razor thin. They can be a few thousand votes, a few hundred votes. The percentages in many races are well below 4%. So if young people had, you knew what their issues were, and by the way, you know, to your point, you can't get perfect, okay? You've got candidates out there that may represent your interests, maybe not all your interests, but you have to make a decision. If you don't vote, you made a decision. And I've heard some young people tell me when I, when I do the same thing as Ms. Green, register voters, well, my vote doesn't count. And I say, yeah, when you don't vote, your vote doesn't count, okay? So, you know, um, if young people voted their interests, that would increase the elected number of people who voted by 4%. That could change the society overnight. So what can you do as a young person? Well, if you're not registered, Ms. Green and I could register you today, okay? I've got copies of the, if you wanna find out about the candidates, we've got copies of the League of Women Voters Voters Guide. They ask the same questions, the same candidates. If a candidate doesn't have an answer, that's because he didn't want to do it, okay? Um, you can read the you know, newspapers without bias, okay? You can belong to a political organization or a civic club, or you can you know, be part of a political action group. And now, again, because I don't want any booze here, okay? Because I think I read this audience, but you know, the League, the, the League of Women Voters, okay, is nonpartisan. So I have to be nonpartisan. So, 
let's suppose you believe that everybody needs a gun and there shouldn't be any rules about guns. And if the NRA says you gotta vote for this candidate, that's what you do. But on the other hand, if you believe that we need more rules about gun regulation, then you, in, in every town for gun safety has a candidate, you would pick that. So these are different ways how you can vote your interests. Um, just, this is real quick. Uh, Ms. Green told the elections on November 7th. One thing I want to emphasize today, if you are not registered and want to register today, you can still vote early. I want to say that again. If you are not, if you register today, you could still vote early. And I'm gonna show you with a QR code how you can check that in a couple of weeks before you go to the polling station, okay? And here's a, if you want this, there's a QR code for a digital copy of the, of the voter's guide. And by the way, you know, there's a lot of old people that do voter registration, okay? We, we need some young people. We need some people that are, you know, who wanna help us you all can maybe communicate with, with um, your peers better than we do. And I wanna thank you for listening and I wanna now present you with the results of your survey. Yeah, so from everybody in here, the three top issues to you all are equity and social justice, abortion rights, and universal healthcare. Another honorable mention of issues that were not listed are the following. One second. The fund of police and reform, immigration, gun violence, mental health, and domestic violence. Okay, so the top three issues again are what? Are equity and social justice, abortion rights, and universal health care. Okay, so compared to 2022 in a different audience, you got you agreed on one of them. So I'm willing to take any questions or comments or. I, just, I, I, oh. I, I think the survey was great, and especially the statistics. The one thing I want to, to ask you is that have you looked at this on the municipal, on the local and state levels? Because like in the election for the last mayoral contest, I think the vote was like 330,000 people voted for a mayor for the fourth largest city in the United States. That's an excellent point. And that's, that's an absolutely excellent point. In fact, everyone thinks, in, in fact, what you say is co absolutely correct. Everybody turns up for the presidential election. That's it. But what affects your community, and Daryl told you this, okay, is your local, local government. So it's the mayor, the council members, okay, judges. And so it starts locally. Local elections are very important. It gets, it's a sort of a, a gateway into thinking about how, you know, what your interests are and who represents you. And again, you will, may, you will not get a perfect candidate. You will not get someone who does everything that you want to do, but you'll have a choice and you have to figure out what that choice is. Because there was also, uh, after the, the final, they had a study and they said that on the state level, like the governor and everything, 65, well, the majority of the voters were predominantly white and over 65. Yeah, now, again, I'm going to go a little bit off track here because I'm going to talk about the election where, where uh, Better O'Rourke was up against uh, Ted Cruz for senator. And that, I think, was like five or six years ago, okay? And I can tell you that if the youth had voted for, like, they, like the old people do, okay? I can tell you who our senator would be, all right? But that didn't happen. I'm not endorsing Beto, I'm not endorsing Cruz, I'm just telling you a fact that it was a very close election. It was probably less than one or 2% difference, okay? And if young people show up, things would change. Now they may not have changed with the governor race because that's a different, you know, ball of wax, okay? But it would have been closer, okay? So.
So can you talk about um, sometimes in elections, um, even for mayoral candidates, uh, it's there's a lot of them and it's overwhelming. Um, what are some strategies on how you would look up people and how you could make a best your best decision to vote? Okay, so great question. So here again is a legal and voters guide. The Houston Chronicle will um, also endorse a candidate. Many times I agree with them, sometimes I don't, but at least it's somebody who's put some thought behind us making a decision. You also may say, you know, what is your issue? My issue is gun rights. My issue is, you know, women's rights. My issue is immigration. And you might try to do a deep dive. It takes work. In other words, you, can't, you just don't show up and decide that you're gonna be civically engaged. You actually have to do some work, okay? And I know we're all busy, but it may be people over 65 are mostly retired, but still, you know, to go back to this, this slide here, the 30 to 44 and the 45 to 64 are still working for the most part. You know, why, why are they showing up, okay? Because they're voting their interest. So, and then, you know, there's different, like, there's different, my wife does this, there's different, uh, there's different um, uh, groups of attorneys that represent different aspects of our society. You know, maybe LBGTQ favorable attorneys, and maybe black, you know, black attorneys, Asian attorneys, and sometimes they'll weigh in on who they would recommend as a, for a judge. So there's different ways of doing that. <clears throat> oh, thank you. For those people who do not know who is running or know anything about them, they can get your your list or they could go to harrisvotes.com for the sample ballot. But also look at those candidates and if you want to know more about them, contact the candidate. You can do that. I talk to them every day. I mean, I'm always got somebody that's it's coming to my walk that whatever, and they want to hear from you. So you can go to, sometimes you'll see their email address or whatever, write to them, tell them who you are and what you want and find out what they can do for you. Who are they? But yes, don't think that these people are a, they're, they're um, don't think that these people are so far above you, they're not. They're your peers, most of them. And just contact them. And I mean, I John Whitmire called me yesterday and said, Do you want me to send some people to walk with you? You know, and um, my granddaughter said, Somebody named John, I don't know who he is, Gigi. <laughs> but just do that. Get involved in that way. You can contact these people and they will talk to you. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Well, thank you. That is it for tonight. Thank you all so much for coming. Another big round of applause for our guests for such a wonderful presentation, for being here today. We admire and we're inspired by all the work that you do. I believe that if everybody raised their hand, hopefully that you all feel mobilized now to hit the polling stations, go vote, go register to, to vote. If you're not already, if you're not already, we have Ms. Norma West Green that can uh, register you to vote, as well as Mr. Mr. Joe that can also register you to vote. Um, so how, how many people here are gonna go and vote? Good, good. We had two events coming up. We had two major walk to votes that are going to happen. If you don't want to go vote by yourself and you want to bring your friends, your family, whoever you want to come with you and vote, you can do so here with us in the main building. And we can, and that's on October 24th. And here on October 31st, you can dress up on October 31st. And it'll be in the evening. It'll be really fun. Um, so thank you all so much. I just want to say two more things uh, based on what our guest speaker said. Um, if you all want to become a uh, voter registrars. You can do that for free in the Harris uh, County page. Um, and you can also become polling station, uh, polling station workers on the Harris County page as well. Um, if you want to look at the candidates that are currently running, it's all listed if you just Google uh, Houston election coming up, Harris County, and you can see 
every candidate that's running with their email address, their phone number, and even an address. So if you want to talk to them, all their information is listed there and it's accessible to everybody. Thank you all for coming today and I truly appreciate everybody's work and participation.